And we welcome you to the Cathedral Church of All Saints here in Halifax, Nova Scotia for this Christmas Eve service. In gathering tonight, we acknowledge the lands upon which we gather. Although we have come together in person and in digital space, we each stand on ground that is the ancestral territory of peoples who were here long before the European settlers crossed the ocean. We gather here in and from the Cathedral Church of All Saints in Halifax, Nova Scotia, located on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. On this holy night, we join the circle of our wreath with the candles of hope, love, peace, and joy. May the light of their flames cast away all doubts and fears in us and affirm God's promises of old. Tonight, we light our center candle as a sign that your promises have been fulfilled. To you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Tonight we celebrate the birth of Jesus, which transforms us and our world. May the light of this flame at the center of our wreath proclaim to one and all that Jesus has come to be at the center of our lives. Dear God, light in the midst of us, center of our story, give us courage to share your message of hope, strive for peace within ourselves, in our world, live your example of love, and to celebrate with joy the glory of this Christmas. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen.
join together in offering the colic prayer for this night. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we prepare with joy to celebrate the gift of the Christ child, embrace the earth with your glory and be for us a living hope. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. We invite you to be seated for the reading of scripture. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the host and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. 
In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. The Gospel of Christ. of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had that experience of being in a grocery store 
And over the PA system, a disembodied voice says, clean up in aisle seven, clean up in aisle seven. And I just picture some poor, disheartened, minimum wage making kid hauling a slopping bucket on wheels by a mop handle, staring down at an oozing puddle of ranch dressing and glittering broken glass shards and wondering, is this what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? So if you can picture that, now take a step backward, a big step backward, a cosmic step, if you will, and hear the heavenly chorus calling out, clean up on the third rock from the sun. God shakes his or her head and wonders, is this what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life? The world, frankly, is a mess. It's not the way God planned it or intended it. We have navigated our way through a pandemic that has claimed nearly seven million lives. The war in Ukraine is before us every day. Just outside our door in the park are tents that house people with no place to go. Crack open a Bible sometime, open to page one. The first chapter of the Bible is called Genesis, a clever title because the word Genesis means the origin or coming into being of something. You see what God did there? Whether you are a creationist or subscribe to evolutionary theory, the opening pages of the Bible describe a transformation from the void of nothingness to life as we know it, in an orderly progression that is surprisingly scientifically accurate. A description of, of life coming into being that seems to fly in the face of the ability of the author or anyone to describe or conceive of 600 years before the birth of the Christ child. That's more than 2,500 years before Georges Lemaitre ever postulated the Big Bang Theory. Not the sitcom, but the concept of an ever-expanding universe emanating from a single cosmic event. On Christmas Day last year, 2021, NASA launched the James Webb Infrared Observatory Telescope designed to learn how galaxies form and grow and to peer, peer far back into the origins of the first galaxies, to watch stars being born inside their nebulous embryos with unprecedented detail. It is both mind-boggling amazing, but also puts life on this planet in frighteningly humbling perspective. So for the author of the book of Genesis, was this just a lucky guess or divine wisdom? At the conclusion of each sequence of creation in the book of Genesis, our unknown author notes, and God saw that it was good. Darkness gives way to light, water recedes and dry land appears, from the waters come creatures of every size and description imaginable, from microscopic amoeba to blue whales. And upon the drying lands, vegetation springs forth to sustain an ever-expanding variety of life forms, sea creatures, creeping things, insects, wild animals, turtles to Tyrannosaurus, birds of the air and winged creatures of every kind. And God sees that it is all good. And then lastly, as the crown of creation, you and me, the very image of God, we are told, filled with the same life breath, the Ruach, the Spirit of God, says the writer of Genesis. And he or she concludes by saying, God saw everything that had been made, 
and indeed it was very good. And all that has been created, including this tiny jewel-like planet itself whirling through the cosmos, God places into our hands, entrusts it to our safekeeping. It's a gift, a present for us and to us for all time. I don't know if you're a Prime member, but you won't get anything like that from Amazon. So given all that goodness, how could anything possibly go wrong? I just want to assure you this sermon is not a biblical exegesis or a science lecture, so there's no need to take notes. But if we go back to that narrative in the book of Genesis, the first act of creation, in the opening sentences of the Bible, was God introducing light into the darkness of nothingness. And it is with the coming of light that everything else unfolds. Now the Gospel writer John doesn't give us the familiar play-by-play -play of Christmas Eve that we just heard in Luke's writing. John reflects theologically on the coming of Jesus into the world with these powerful and poetic words. He says, Jesus was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and that life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never overcome it. The darkness has never overcome it. In the old King James Version of the Bible, the text reads, and the darkness comprehended it not. The darkness doesn't understand the power of light. And I think that's why we're here tonight. We come out into the night in a world that is a mess to find a glimmer of light. Some of you, I suspect, are here because you know this deeply. It is what sustains you through thick and thin, through the high points and low moments of your life. You know that darkness will not be the final word for you. Others are here perhaps out of a sense of nostalgia or tradition. It's part of what you do at Christmas. It's comforting to connect with the familiar, the bright memories of the past, particularly after being denied them for the past two Christmases. And others of you may be here secretly, perhaps desperately hoping to find something to believe in, something to hope for, to break through the darkness of whatever your darkness may be, whether it be loss or anxiety, feelings of helplessness or life out of control. For these, this has been our reality for the past two years and ten months. And we, many of us, have been worn thin. If you had been here at the outset of Advent, you would have heard me make reference to a movie called A Boy Named Christmas, based on a children's book by contemporary writer Matt Haig, who along with a slew of children's books, has written several best-selling novels such as The Midnight Library, How to Stop Time, and The Humans. And while it is billed as a children's movie full of mystery and magic, the movie has a lot to teach us adults. Among the cast are Dame Maggie Smith and Jim Broadbent. It's filmed on location in Finland, Lapland, and London, and the cinematography itself is stunning. It tells the story of an ancient kingdom that has fallen upon hard times. And so in the opening scene, the king summons the people of the kingdom together to address them and challenge them to a quest. The king says, we all know times are hard. I mean really, really, really hard. 
I can't remember the last time I smiled, can you? What is there to smile about? We're all miserable. We're all missing something. And I think we all know what that is. And as he pauses to take a breath, people in the crowd shout out, a better health care system, a living wage, a fair system of governance, enough food to feed all the people. The king pauses somewhat baffled and said, uh, no, all good suggestions. But I'll tell you what I think it is we are missing. Hope. We all need hope a spark of magic to keep us all going. And that is the quest the king lays before them to go and search for and to bring back something of hope. What might hope look like to you? Darkness and light are competing image, images in scripture and there is a lot going on out there to compel us to believe the gathering darkness of this world is gaining the upper hand. We heard the voice of a prophet named Isaiah this evening who said to the people of his day who walked in darkness that they have seen a great light, that those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them light has shined. So we have to make a choice as to what we're going to believe in. It's as simple as that and as difficult as that. We can be drawn, I think, into the circle of light that is Christmas, or we can walk away as though this is no more than the stuff of fairy tales. Either way, life will go on, but how we personally perceive life and respond to life can and will be radically altered by this encounter tonight with the word made flesh. To a broken, dark, and beleaguered world, God came, but not as a powerful, thundering autocrat, not with a celestial bucket and mop to sweep the house clean, but rather God came in the most unlikely of ways, in ways surreal, the Creator chose to come among us as a fragile, vulnerable baby, born to frighten young parents miles from home on a winter's night. Emmanuel is the Hebrew name given to him, a name which literally translates as God is with us. God is with us. This Christmas night is not just about remembering the touching and amazing story that scripture tells us of that night in Bethlehem some 2,022 years ago. It is about the ability to comprehend the extraordinary reality of a God that loves us and loves and has hopes and dreams for this fragile earth we call home. A God that loves us too much to simply leave us up to our own devices or leave it all to chance. God is with us. And with God comes light. And the light dispels the darkness. Here is what I find extraordinary in the midst of all the hatred and anger and inhumanity that parades across our field of vision day after day after day until belief in God that is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-loving seems like some kind of a bad joke. For every act of violence, there is this countering force, this energy, this spirit that will not be thwarted. This cathedral community strives to embody that. This community desires to strengthen you in the quest to be sources of light in your own right. Emmanuel, God is with us. The cords of compassion suddenly connecting strangers 
as if we were all family. And that's what it is. You see, we are family. We may at times be a broken family, a highly dysfunctional family, but when confronted with the choice of darkness over light, time and time again we turn to the light. Later in John's Gospel, Jesus makes the statement, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's not self-adulation, that's a simple statement of who he is and why he came here. And it's also an invitation for us to take a stand with him. That's what the darkness can't comprehend. That's why the light has never been overcome. And those are the signs for me that God is still with us. For the truth remains that despite who we are and what we are, in fact, precisely because of who we are and what we are, God still comes to us. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. The writer and theologian Frederick Beekner, in reflecting on the mystery of the incarnation, the birth we celebrate this night, writes, to look at the last great self-portraits of Rembrandt, or to read Pascal, or hear Bach's B minor mass, is to know beyond the need for further evidence that if God is anywhere, he is with them, as he is also with the man behind the meat counter, the woman who scrubs the floors, the high school math teacher who explains fractions to a bewildered child. And the step from God with them to Emmanuel, God with us, may not be as great a gulf as it seems. What keeps the wild hope of Christmas alive year after year in a world notorious for dashing all hope is the daunting dream that the child who was born that day may yet be born again, even in us even in us. And let that be our prayer this night, that God will be born again in us, that we will be light in the darkness, hope for this world. Amen.
As you are able, I invite you to stand as we offer an affirmation of our faith in the words of the Creed. For we confess our faith as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Gracious God, as a star rose and drew people from great distances to Bethlehem that they might greet the Christ child, draw us to you that we might be the people you call us to be. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. As you gave Mary your Holy Spirit, filling her with the delight of your presence, fill us with your spirit and renew our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for Linda, our primate, Sandra, our bishop, our wardens, Mayan and Zachary, for Paul, our rector and dean, Helen, our associate priest, deacons, Ray, Heather, and Maggie, Jillian, our engagement leader, our associated parish of St. James in Herring Cove, Paul, Nick, Russ, and Pauline, and all who make music in this place and all others who minister here in so many ways, both lay and ordained. As Gentiles streamed to Jesus' light and kings to the brightness of his rising, draw our nation, our civic leaders, and all in authority to his brightness. Lord, in your mercy. As angels sang glorious to you and proclaimed peace on earth and goodwill among all people, bring us your peace. Bring an end to terror and strife. Lord, in your mercy. As shepherds were drawn away from their flocks by night, draw those who do not know you yet to the knowledge and love of you. Lord, in your mercy. As Jesus was born in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn, be especially present with those who have nowhere to lay their head, those who are vulnerable and those who are hungry. Lord, in your mercy. As the Holy Family gathered together in Bethlehem and traveled together to far off lands, bless all families, especially the families of this parish, and protect those who must travel. Lord, in your mercy. As your Son came to proclaim the forgiveness of sins and the gift of life eternal, give the departed eternal rest and let light perpetual shine on them. Today we remember Fran Debley and Susan Cochran. Let us pray for our own needs and for the needs of others, for those who are sick, especially Stephanie, Marianne, Steve, Jennifer, Phoenix, Elaine, 
Lorraine, David, Susan, Maureen, healthcare workers, April, Dan, Andrea, Angus, and Aaron, and those known to you alone. We pray for their families. We pray for those serving in the Canadian forces and for forces worldwide. We pray for those who have died, especially those in whose memory flowers and gifts have been given to this parish. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord our God, may the light and hope of this night and the light of your Son's incarnation reassure our hearts that you are among us, that you hear our prayer, and that you will be with us always, even to the end of the age. Lord, in your mercy. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you.
As we offer these gifts, we offer ourselves in service and love, and we pray. Source of light and gladness, accept all we offer you on this joyful feast. May we grow up in him who unites our lives to yours, for he is Lord now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift it to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give knowledge of salvation in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, we lift our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. As our prayer continues, you may remain standing or seated in prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. You sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the savior and redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. After supper, 
he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, gathering to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we made acceptable in him may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new. And bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break the bread of life, and that life is the light of the world. God, here among us, light in the midst of us, bring us to life and life. And these are the gifts of God. For the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
we invite you to come forward for communion. Also, we would ask when you come forward to take a candle for your return. We uh, neglected to pass them out.
Father of all, tonight you have united earth and heaven in sending your Son to take our human nature. May we who have tasted heavenly things share in the life of his eternal kingdom. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. We thank you for joining us tonight. May you go safely into the dark, carrying the light of Christ. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this night and always. Amen. to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.